Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, April the 6th, 2022. It is currently 3.42 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Abilene, Texas. So, so I have to ask, how are things going for you right now? Have you had a good 24 hours? Have, did you have a good night of sleep? Did you have a good morning? Did you have a good afternoon? Wh- whenever you hear this, how are things going for you? Well, if I'm honest with you right now, it's not been a great, uh, well, how many hours? What, 12 hours, 13 hours? It's not been a great 12 or 13 hours for me. It has been very, very bad. Um, for many of you, you know I have a seizure disorder. And last night, well, it was, well, actually early this morning, starting, I don't, maybe it was around, was, did it start at 2 a.m., 1 a.m.? Somewhere starting between 1 and 2 a.m. I I, I don't even know how many seizures I had. I don't even know. It has been absolutely crazy. I woke up everywhere from outside, on the back porch, the living room floor, bedroom. Floor. I woke up everywhere. Um, it, yeah, my, my body, my body feels like I have been beaten down with like, you know, by six people with baseball bats. And that's not even hyperbole. I'm not doing great, but... When you're not doing great, it's always important to turn your focus back on the things of God. If there's if there's a lesson in all of this, no matter what's happening in your life, physical illness, difficulty, struggle, discouragement, anger, depression, sadness, whatever it may be feeling, the the only thing we can ever do is turn to our 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 source of spiritual food, our our source of, of, of spiritual direction, our source of 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 stability. It is God's word. Uh, everything in us is never is never a source of stability or a source of direction or a source of truth because everything in us is always confused. We have emotions and it can just leave. We, yeah, when we, when we set everything aside to follow ourselves, it always leads to, it leads to things far worse than, than we're already encountering or already experiencing. And in many cases, it will lead us to make rash decisions. I mean, in fact, we should never make any kind of decision or even act when we are emotional. But no matter what is going on in your life, the only thing I know to do, like, you know, when when everything else falls apart, all you can do is just pick up a Bible and turn your focus there. Get get your attention on the things of God. Get your get your focus off self. Get your focus off circumstances. Get your focus off your emotions and turn to God's word. So that's what I'm going to try to do over the next couple of hours is I'm going to try to do a number of broadcasts. And then tonight at 7 p.m., I'll be at Victory Baptist Church to do the evening service. Uh, now, some may say I probably shouldn't be doing anything live on the air today. Cons- well, I mean, considering less than what twelve hours ago, I was in, I was involved in who knows how many seizures. Um, but I'm going to just be cautious, and if I feel that I say anything incorrect, then I will delete the episode immediately. Or if I feel like I say a lot of good things but just make a slight mistake, then I will clearly offer an apology or a correction later on. But this this is very therapeutic to me uh, because it uh, it's getting me it's forcing me to think and it's 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 and it's getting my attention off, you know, I could have a pity party, feel bad for myself having to go through this because my seizure disorder wasn't, you know, was given to me basically by the United States military. We won't go through everything that happened. It was it was my it was my parting gift. Here you go. Okay. Now, at the same time, I don't want to I don't want to make it sound bad because, in many cases, because everything that happened to me well does give me the opportunity to, well, uh, do podcasting and and do everything that I do because uh, of 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 being taken care of because they medically retired me, so I get my medical retirement, and then the VA declared me 100% disabled. So in some ways, it turned out to be somewhat of a blessing, but when I go through the seizures, I sometimes joke when I go through the seizures that I'm, that I'm just a, 
I'm, I'm, I'm earning my pay. Uh, so I, I sometimes make it a joke that what's, you know, so what's, what's your job? My job is to have seizures. That's, that's what my job is. I fall on the floor, flop around, have seizures, beat myself up. And, uh, you know, there, there you go. So yeah, if you see, could see my face right now. Yeah. It looks like, uh, I went a couple of rounds with someone, but let's set all of that aside because that's the last thing I want to do. But, uh, but I just want you to understand why I'm doing this because it is therapeutic for me. It, it is, it really is. Um, I, I, I just, I, I like sitting here with, on a ta- at a table with a microphone, stacks of Bibles and notebooks, and try to get my attention off everything else. Just try to get it away from everything else. And so hopefully this will be beneficial. And what's kind of funny is, it's not really funny, it, 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 it probably makes sense. What I have to do right now is try to offer not really a correction, but at least additional information to uh, an episode I did yesterday. Now, if you've been with us and if you've been paying attention, we've been doing a number of episodes dealing with sexual violence in the Bible. Not a pleasant topic, not a a horrible topic, all right? Not something we want to talk about. But one of the reasons we were doing this is because we, we had a discussion about how people say that that in many cases, the, the passages in the Bible that deal with sexual violence are never talked about within the church. The church doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want to address it, or they'll take these passages that clearly deal with sexual violence, and instead of focusing on the sexual violence, we try to say the moral of the lesson, the moral of the story is this or this or this, and do almost everything we can to to, to not make the focus on the sexual violence. So we've been looking at some passages, all right? The first passage we looked at is the story in Genesis chapter 9, uh, Genesis chapter 9, where Noah gets drunk, takes off all of his clothes, something happens in his tent that results in him, well, cursing Canaan. And we're a little confused because Canaan didn't seem to be involved in the situation. So it's a little bit confusing, but we looked at that. And many feel, and let me just state this right before we, I, 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 I should have started this way. I apologize. Um, just make sure that what we're getting ready to discuss, well, can time have some very adult themes. And I will try to say things in a very blunt way. So just be warned, be warned now. But yes, the Bible has some passages that deal with some very mature themes and mature situations and tell stories of horrible things happening, dealing with sexual violence. So many feel that what occurred is that Noah was sexually assaulted. Noah was possibly raped in that situation. We looked at all the possibilities of that and how to understand that. So we went from Genesis 9, not going to go back and review all of that. Then we turn to Genesis chapter 16, where we have the story of Abram and Hagar. Abram and Hagar. Remember, Sarai has been unable to get pregnant. She decides, you know what? Here's my our slave. Here's my slave, my handmaid, Hagar. Go in unto her and, well, produce a child. And we, we realize because of Hagar's position, consent wouldn't have even, wouldn't have even, it wouldn't have mattered one way or the other. And that there's a, there's at least a possibility of understanding what occurred here as rape. It, it's, it's, it's a horrible story. It's a horrible story. At, at least at very, at the very best, I should say, uh, Abram would clearly be guilty of adultery and polygamy. There's, there's no way to get around that. Um, and then at worse, clearly rape. But we do know this, know that Abram and Sarai, typically viewed as heroes of the faith, godly people, viewed as, you know, you know we, we need to be like them and we need to learn from them. Well, we do know this, that there are three things, there are three actual things they would be guilty of, polygamy, adultery, and then abuse. Because after this, after Hagar conceives and, and brings forth a son, brings forth a child, well, then look what happens. Uh, Genesis 16, 4, and, and he went in unto Hagar, speaking of Abram, having relations with Hagar, she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. I've given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. 
But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So Abram's like, hey, do whatever you want to her. Like he doesn't even, and remember, this is one of the troubling things in the story. Hagar is just viewed as a means to an end, viewed as a tool they could use. It, it's horrible. It's horrible the way Hagar is treated. And then she's, Sarai deals harshly with her, not in a godly way, not even in, not even in a way that demonstrates compassion or understanding in a horrible way. And it's so bad that Hagar flees which would be a crazy thing to do as a slave. Like you've got to be suffering pretty bad because the consequences could be pretty severe of fleeing. Takes off and, and runs away. Um, and we, we, we talked about how the story ultimately ends. Um, she, an angel, it's crazy story. An angel of the Lord appears unto Hagar. Uh, she, 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 she realizes that God sees her and she has seen the one who has seen her which is kind of a beautiful concept right there. But the angel tells her to go back, go back. So she goes back. She, she bear, she gives birth to the son. And if we, we read about it here, um, verse 13, and she called the name of the Lord, uh, spoken to her, thou God, thou, thou God seest me. For she said, I have, I also here looked after him that seeth me. Wherefore, uh, the well was called, Okay, and it goes through the name of that. Then verse 15, and Hagar bear Abraham a son. That's what I was trying to get to. And Hagar bear Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bear Ishmael, or Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bear Ishmael to Abram. All right, so she goes back. She's told by God to go back. Now, this, re- this is just a crazy thing to even try to wrap your mi- mind around. And remember, it's okay to struggle with it. It's okay. It's okay as believers to just be honest with the text and go, what in the world? Hagar, clear- clearly she was abused. Clearly, clearly she's being used and possibly raped. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I mean, many, many people, it's just weird. Many people don't even want to address the possibility, but clearly just the position there is not an equal, there's no play, way that this, the, the power thing here is just off. And so clearly things are not, not good here. Things are not good here. And she's told to go back and you're almost like, what in the world, which could lead people to come up to with some really, really, really bad ideas and theology when it comes to sexual abuse. But remember, this is a one-time historical situation where God is involved, right? I don't think this is here is giving us a prescription of what we're called to do. We should always look to protect the woman and get the woman out of the situation, and the woman should never be forced to stay in a situation where she's being abused. That's We should all be able to agree on that. But horrible story. Now, it ends there. Or the way I taught it yesterday is like, well, it ends there. And I even said, well, you know, um, we don't we don't have any idea that, you know, when she goes back, was she abused again? Meaning my, my idea, did Sarah do horrible things to her again? Did Abram rape her again? If rape occurred, did he have any physical relations with her again? So I, I, I kind of just left the story there. Now, someone in the comment section yesterday, I think they, I think they sent the comment right as I was going off the air or right as I went off the air. And immediately when I saw it, I'm like, oh man, I messed up so bad. I should have at least let everyone know. And I'm not, and I, and I understand that most people listening already know how the story ends with Hagar and Ishmael, but I should have at least brought it up because I think this is an important part of the story as well. And it's not pretty, it's ugly and it's horrible. And we see the rest of this story in Genesis and we can uh, go to it. Uh, Genesis chapter uh, 21, Genesis chapter 21, Genesis chapter 21, all right? And so Sarai, uh, now her name is Sarah, Abram, who's now Abraham. Abraham and Sarah, they, Sarah finally becomes pregnant and she gives birth to Isaac. Now, remember, Hagar's returned. Hagar's there, Ishmael's there. 
clearly this kind of a, poly, a, a polygamous kind of situation. Again, I don't know if Abram is having relations with Hagar through this. We could possibly assume he was, and which raises all kinds of you know moral and ethical questions, but it just demonstrates once again, this is so important, that the people of God, I don't care where you look, Genesis to Revelation, I don't care if you look to the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, 300s, or 2022, the church and God's people is there constantly, we see evidence of them being more influenced by the culture than them influencing the culture. And so a lot of people say, well, this was just the culture then. Just because it was the culture doesn't excuse it. It demonstrates the power of the culture to influence the people of God, right? So they're, they're, they're you know, this, this, whatever you want to call it, this family, okay, clearly broken, clearly messed up. And then we read what happens. Genesis chapter 21, verse 8, and the child grew and was weaned and Abram made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Verse 9. All right, here we go. So we got Sarah, we got Abram, we got Isaac, we got Hagar, we got Ishmael. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abram, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Clearly, in Genesis 21, 9, what we continue to see is there's problems in this family. There's problems in this entire situation. And we have to realize this. This is such, and I, this is carrying on from yesterday. I just, I'm going to continue to just repeat this over and over. One of the clear lessons in all of this is once we stop listening to God's word, once we stop trying to follow God's will, God's word, and we turn to our own will, our own agenda, agenda our own ideas, it always leads to one horrible situation after another, after another. And here's what makes sin so difficult. We can sin. We can confess that sin. We are completely forgiven of that sin, but the consequences of that sin sometimes are far lasting and it just creates problem and problem. And some, and the Bible doesn't always tell you how to fix every one of these problems, but clearly they stopped, they, 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 they didn't listen to God and they tried to fix the situation on their own. And it's led to everything, polygamy, adultery, rape, abuse. It, it's just an absolute total mess. And we should not excuse it in any way. It's, it's almost like we want to just play it down. Well, you know, Abraham was great. Abraham's a hero of faith. Abram and Sarah, they're just wonderful, great, awesome people. No, it just shows God's people can be horrible, horrible individuals who do horrible, horrible things. So Sarah just like, get, get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them. So look what he, again, she said unto Abram, cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Get rid of him. There's no compassion. There's no godliness. There's no love. There's just get rid of them. We, 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 we in other words, they've been used and well, now we don't need them anymore. We, we don't need them anymore. We've got Isaac, basically get rid of them. Just, and it. There's just, there's no way to read that. And again, everyone will say, it's the culture, it's the culture. But the culture should not be the thing. God's people should not be the ones reflecting the culture. God's people are supposed to be the ones reflecting something counter to said culture. And, and the thing was grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Abraham doesn't like this. Abraham's bothered by it. He's grieved by it. Well, the whole story is grievous. The whole story is horrible. The whole story is horrific. And God said unto Abram, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, this is just, there's no easy way here to, to read this. Because we read it and say, well, see, uh, this is God's will. This is God's plan. Yes, but it's still, uh, Ishmael and Hagar are human beings who are about to be cast out, who, who was brought in, used, and now are going to be cast out. 
And God is like, do this. It, it's, it, it's, it's really heartbreaking. It's really horrible that God's people here are acting in this situation. And God, well, God is directing this at this point. Verse 13. And also of the son of the bondwoman, uh, it says, uh, for an Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. Now, this seems to indicate that, okay, go ahead and get rid of them. And God seems to be indicating, I'm going to, I'm going to take, take care of them. And that the son um, is going to, a nation is going to form from the, um, from the son. I'm going to, I'm going to bless, because he's your son, I'm going to bless him in this way. Verse 14, and Abram rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, gave it unto Hagar, putting it, her, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So, I mean, we, we can just read past that, but that's got to be horrible. Go, just go. You're done. Get out. Get out. Just go. Just go. Again, even if even if you reject rape, even if you reject that interpretation, which be hard pressed not to, clearly polygamy and adultery. And even 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 if you don't even want to bring in polygamy and adultery, because maybe you try to well, polygamy would be hard because you could say that that was established early on in Genesis. If you want to say, well, there's been no prohibition against it, oh, well. You could you could try to make an argument that in the early part of Genesis, maybe you do kind of have the idea of a prohibition against adultery because it's supposed to be one man, one woman together become one flesh. But if you say, well, the Mosaic law against adultery hadn't been written yet, so therefore they can't be judged according to that. Clearly, the polygamy is there. And not only that, I think just the basic human decency of treating people with some kind of decency is clearly just, I mean, put it this way. It has been established early on in Genesis that people are created in God's image. And I don't think this is the way you treat image bearers. I don't think this is the way you treat people who are created in the, in the image of God. You treat them, I mean, this, this is treating them almost like an animal that's used for a purpose and then just p- pushed out and cast out. Now, I know God is involved in this. God is involved in this, but it's still just horrible. All right, so she's wandering around in the wilderness of Beersheba, verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she w- she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and set her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. She reaches to, to such the, the situation gets so bad, it seems to feel she fears the child's going to die. So she's going to put the child down under a shrub. She's going to walk away because she can't watch the child die. I can't see, I can't watch it. I can't watch it. I can't watch my child die. I mean, how, how horrible of a situation can one, I mean, it's hard to even wrap your mind around this horrible situation. Here's this woman, clearly he's been abused. Now, again, Obviously, she's treated so harshly she fled earlier on back in Genesis 16. So clearly there's abuse and impossibly raped. And now here she's the one who's cast out. She's the one now possibly getting ready to see her son die. Horrible situation. But we do have this. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, what aileth aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water, and she gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew up and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, Paran, and his mother took him him a wife out of the land of Israel. Egypt. There you go. God does step in. Awesome. Praise God. That is good. I am glad God steps in. But again, you you do have to struggle with this. I think I think it's perfectly fair to struggle with this. Why does God step in constantly after the bad happens, right? She's taken as a slave. God doesn't stop that from happening. It happens. 
then she's used to try to produce a child for Abram and Sarai. God doesn't step in. She's then abused by, well, she's given to Abram to be a wife. So polygamy, God doesn't step in. Then she's abused by Sarai. God doesn't step in. She flees. Then God steps in. But he steps in to say, go back. Then she has to live in this situation. We'd have to figure out exactly how many years it is. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But she lives there for a number of years. And then, once again, she's put out. And then God steps in and then blesses. Every time God steps in, it's after the fact. It's after the pain. It's after the suffering. It's after the abuse. And that is... That, that is one of the hardest things I think that a Christian, I think this is a lesson every young Christian should, I think this should be like a part of discipleship class. Look, here's the way this works. We do trust God and we do believe God and we do believe God is all powerful. God, God is omniscient. He's omnipotent, all powerful. He is everywhere at all times. He knows all things. He, he, he's, 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 he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. We, we believe these things to be true of God because the word of God gives us this information about God. And so never forget God is all seeing, all powerful. He's all knowing he's everywhere. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever, don't ever allow circumstances to question you to question God's presence, God's power, and God's knowledge. Don't ever allow it to, to, to call God into question because the word of God, which is infallible and inerrant, gives us this information about God. However, you have to be prepared for this. Even though God is all-knowing, even though God is present everywhere at all times, even though God is all-powerful, time and time again, He will not intervene to stop the pain, the tragedy, or the hurt. And you're going to get really bothered by that. You're going to get really frustrated by that. And it can cause you to question, and it can can become a spiritual pitfall. Because when I read these stories, I'm like, okay, God, why didn't you step in and protect Hagar from these so-called godly people? Because her experience with these godly people, there was nothing godly or great about it. She would have been better off finding herself with some you know, atheist somewhere, because these people of God are horrible in this story. All right? But this is very important. We have to understand God, in many cases, does not step in to prevent these things from happening that we want him to prevent, because his way is not our way. His will is not our will. He has his own purpose and his own plan. So what we have to do is when everything goes, when, 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 when we don't understand, we just keep trusting God. We keep turning to God. We keep trusting God. Now, you could say God does step in at least to keep the child from starving and to keep them from starving. He does step in, I guess, before that tragedy takes place. But there's other tragedies he doesn't intervene in. And you're going to experience that in your Christian life. I... I was a young, I mean, I became a Christian as a teenager, I hadn't been saved very long, and I'm there pleading and begging with, with God to save my mom who out just, you know, one day she's okay, the next day, you know, everything goes wrong, an aneurysm in her, you know, she has an aneurysm, and it, it's, it's over. I mean, basically, she goes from fine to gone in, in almost no time, but as, as while we were waiting for the official, you know, be able to declare her dead. It took, I mean, for all practical purposes, she was gone, but they couldn't declare her dead yet. They had to wait uh, for a while to do tests to to see if there was any brain waves. But I begged and begged and begged and begged and begged and begged. And my mom did not get better. She did not walk out of the hospital. She died. My father had cancer, begged, pleaded, prayed, died. It, it, that's God doesn't always step in. There's other, there's people in my church who've experienced great tragedy and, and horrible things happen. They begged and pleaded with God. Didn't happen. God doesn't always step in. God doesn't step in. And it's really, sometimes when you read the Bible, you're, you're, you're going to, it's just something that like, I think every young Christian needs to see this because a lot of times Christians don't want to talk about this. We, we almost want to make excuses for it, but there's no excuse to be made. There's situations where God steps in. When Sarai, when Abram, when Abram lies and says, that's not my wife, that's not my wife, and she's taken where something could happen to her, God steps in and stops anything from happening to Sarai. He stops it from happening. Doesn't stop anything from happening to Hagar. 
Sarai is protected, Hagar's not. Why? Why? You're going to see that over, in some situations, he steps in almost to stop the sin from happening. Other situations, he doesn't. He, he, he will intervene in some situations, doesn't intervene in the situation, whatever happened to Noah, doesn't intervene in that situation, doesn't intervene, intervene in the situation with Hagar, doesn't intervene, intervene in the situation with David and what he did. I mean, I could, there's, it's like sometimes you'll read like, oh, God, God is active and he moves in a mighty, powerful way. Angels show up, parting of the Red Sea, plagues, a voice from heaven. Like, you know, you'll see sometimes these massive, powerful interventions. And then other times you're like, where, where was God? Why, why didn't you stop that? Why didn't you stop that? Why didn't, why didn't you intervene? Now here he does intervene. Two times, Hagar finds herself somewhere else and God steps in. Two times. But he didn't step in to stop the initial things from occurring. And that's just, we have to, that's just a a reality we have to deal with. We have to deal with it. But, But it's, yeah, I mean, there's the story. There's the story. There, there's the there's the rest of the story as uh, as we should say, and it's still not easy to say. It's still not easy to talk about. It just didn't, just remember everything that goes wrong starts with two people who are supposedly following God. The friend, you know, Abram referred to as sometimes the friend of God, Father Abraham. These these heroes of the faith. It starts with these heroes of the faith as they are sometimes viewed, going. You know what? Uh, we know what you said, we know what you promised, but we're going to take matters into our own hands. And once, listen, once we stop listening to God's word, we start listening to our own word. We will quickly, look, the minute we stop listening to God's word, we replace it with our own word, with our own narrative, with our own ideas, with our own plans, which almost always leads into tragedy and people get hurt. Sometimes, and we talked about this last time, when we stop listening to God's word, we replace it with the word, the philosophy, the narrative of the culture in which we find ourselves. And we, we, we see that play out here as well. We see their own ideas and the ideas of culture dominating these people of God. And Hagar is the one who suffers. And Ishmael is the one who suffers. Abram remains blessed. And this is very important. This demonstrates Abram wasn't righteous in practice time and time again, but he was declared to be righteous by faith. You and I are not righteous in practice constantly in our Christian life, but we are declared to be righteous by faith. Abram is in the hall of faith, not because of his righteousness, but because of his faith, because he he was filled with unrighteousness time and time again. And I, I, I wish I could say, like, I wish that I could look at Genesis 16, Genesis, what, 21 there. I wish I could look at that story and go, look, to anyone who's ever suffered any kind of sexual abuse, rape, harassment, I wish I could tell you to look to this story and say, hey, I, you know, find great comfort in this. I wish I could say that. I, I, I guess the only comfort I can find in some ways, as God sees, but that may not be of any comfort because you're like, well, if God sees, why didn't he stop it? I wish I had an answer. Hagar's not given that answer. And you're probably, you're an, I, again, the only, God only speaks to us through his, through his written word today. So you're not, you may never know as well. We're not always given the answer to why God didn't intervene to, towards the abuse we suffered. Why didn't God intervene when I went through what I went through as a child? Why didn't God intervene? Before what happened to me, that leads me to these seizures, the seizure disorder that I'm still suffering with today. Why doesn't God intervene and remove the seizures? Why doesn't he just get rid of them? Why, why does it just go away? I will never be given that answer, but I know God sees. I know God knows. I know he's all powerful. All we can do is continue to follow him even when it doesn't make any sense. All right, there's probably more I could say there, but I'm just going to stop. I wanted to finish the story because I, I failed to do that yesterday. And uh, it's just funny that I'm trying to correct what I did yesterday on a day that I shouldn't be correcting anything. Oh, a day of, uh, well, uh, we'll call it my seizure day because uh, uh, hours ago. But 
And maybe, maybe that's the, maybe this was the right time to talk about this. Maybe it was the right time. All right. Nobody's asked any questions. So I'm, I am going to do something because a couple of times uh, the chats are not showing up in the Spreaker app. So let me just go here, make sure I didn't miss anything. All right. Okay. Oh yeah. There are, com- there are comments. Oh wait, no, this is, hang on. That's from yesterday. All right, here we go. Here. All right. There we go. Yeah, no messages. Okay. I, I was going to yesterday's episode and saying I was getting ready to start trying to answer all of the questions, all the comments from yesterday. And that would have been really, really, really bad because uh, I would have gotten all confused and discombobulated. But at least I caught it before I did. All right. I hope I said everything correctly. I know I definitely struggled a little bit with reading, but I think it's, I think I did relatively okay. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, probably the best thing, probably, I think probably sometimes the best thing for every preacher is that we are, is, that we are made as weak as possible uh, because then we're not relying on our own ability, on our own effort. But I hope God will use this in some way. And, and to anyone out there who suffered from sexual abuse, I wish I had a kind word here that I could, I wish I had a word that I could just give you from this story. It's a horrible story and it may, it may cause you to struggle a little bit. And I can understand the struggle. I never experienced sexual abuse, uh, physical, mental, psychological. I mean, I could go through all the horrible things that they were horrible. And what I, I, I just, I don't understand why I will never understand why, Um, but if I it, here's my thing, if I turn my back on God, that doesn't make the the everything that happened to me go away. Here, here here's what I know. Th- this is the way I, I will at least say this. Here's how some ways I've tried to process it. Believing in God at least makes it clear that I can say what happened to me. I believe was sinful and evil and wrong because we're supposed to love even our enemies. We're supposed to do good to them who persecute us. So clearly what happened to me as a child wasn't love. That wasn't even the love that you should give an enemy. It was horrible and it was wrong. And I can condemn it morally because of scripture. If I throw out God, I could say, well, it was... It was illegal, but they never got in trouble legally. So, you know, I mean, what moral, no, what's, what's my moral basis to condemn it? So I'm really kind of left in like a, a limbo there and how I condemn, condemn what happened to me, right? Oh, a counselor may say, well, what they did to you was wrong, but what, what if they don't believe what they did was wrong? You know, so then it goes into whose morality is right. It just becomes a, a slipping, a, a, a slippery slope, a sinking sand. It, it, there's nothing with God. At least I know what I can say dogmatically, what was done to me was wrong. It was not scriptural. It was not biblical. It's not the way you treat anyone. All right. So I can condemn it. I do know this. Um, I, I, I don't I don't know why God didn't intervene, but I do believe God was has a purpose and a plan in it. I don't know what that may be. I may, may never truly understand it. In other words, I, the, put it this way: even if I walk away from God, I'm still left with the abuse. What happened to me happened to me, and nothing's going to change that. It, so just throwing away God doesn't make it any better. I know. Believing in a God can make you very upset because God didn't do what I wanted him to do. But the Bible never even, never indicates that that's how he operates. God never, there's nowhere in the Bible where it seems like, you know, oh, God's going to step in. I mean, God can, God could step in and confront Adam and Eve, but he could, and he even, he even stepped in in a sense to warn Cain, but he couldn't step in to stop the murder. So, so it's like the Bible never promised us that he's going to stop in to stop all tragedy. It's never been promised. It's just sometimes the way we have sold Christianity. But there you go. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. I'm going to possibly try to get one more thing done. And then, and then uh, well, 7 o'clock tonight, we'll be live streaming from Victory Baptist Church. So make sure you tune in, all right? The Church One app, that's the one to get, Church One. And just once you download the Church One app, just do a search for Theology Central. And then it just basically uses our RSS feed and pulls everything in. It's a generic app used by all kinds of people, but it becomes our app when you just type in Theology Central. So that that just gives you everything. All right, I'll start right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.